if we found the text today, Psalm 119, verse 105 reads from the King James text. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to talk to us for a little while on the topic, lamps help, but light is better. Hallelujah. Lamps help, but light is better. Father, once again, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come into what is for us the house of God, a sacred space, the sanctuary of the Almighty, an area that has been set aside and consecrated for the purpose of worship and learning and growing in our faith. Father, as the word of God would go forth at this hour, I always, always recognize the need for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch your messenger today, Lord. You've given me a word for the people of God. And if I'm to deliver it effectively, if I'm to deliver it in a manner, oh God, that will bring forth fruit in the lives of those that hear, then, Lord, I need the assistance of the Holy Ghost. Speak to the heart of the hearer. Allow them to know, God, that what they're hearing is from heaven and not merely from the mind, the conjuring, the imagination of the preacher. And we ask it all today and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Boy, I'll tell you what. Most of us, if you've been born and raised in any kind of an evangelical or fundamentalist church, this was probably one of the first verses that you memorized as a kid. You remember in Sunday school or in children's church, they try to help us memorize certain Bible passages. Well, surely Psalm 119 verse 105 is one of the first. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And do you know for one of the most commonly quoted and memorized and, under, and, and uh, read passages in the Word of God, it is probably one of the least understood. Pastor Charles, you say that all the time. Well, that's because a lot of the Bible is misunderstood. First of all, you cannot interpret it without taking into context the context. And then you cannot interpret it loosely. See, a lot of people just love to interpret stuff as loose as a goose. When God doesn't speak loosely. If God says, I don't like chewing gum, he does not mean I don't like certs. He does not mean I don't like uh, hard candy. He means I don't like chewing gum. Do you follow what I'm saying? The entire law was written with such specificity. Everything in the law that's written is so specific, right down to the act. God never condemned in the context of the law any group of people. He made no effort in the universe to identify any particular group of people. God did not identify, for instance, homosexuals as a group of people. No, he spoke of an act. One act. By the way, got news for you. Homosexual men can commit a number of physical intimate acts. That particular act is not the only one in the arsenal. But he only referred to that one act. Yet we have churches and we have preachers in our world today who love to try to loosely translate that passage and they try to apply it to all gay and lesbian people in a very broad way. No, it doesn't work that way. Talk to a Jewish rabbi and see if they interpret it as loosely and as wildly as you do. Because i got news for you, I've done the study, I've done the research, I've taken the time, and they don't. They do not. 
I'm going to tell you, all my life I've been in the Pentecostal church. I've heard preachers take little points in the Scripture, little things in the Word of God, and then turn it into basically whatever they wanted to turn it into to make a pretty little sermon. Uh -huh. For instance, I've heard sermons about David and Goliath and how Goliath, uh, David chose five smooth stones from the the brook bed, you know, to fight against Goliath with. And then I've had preachers preach what those five stones represented. Hallelujah, glory to God. Then I researched and I got to understand the Jewish faith, which the Christian faith is born out of, mind you. The Jewish faith gave birth to the Christianity, of course. And you know what I found out, Johnny? Five has a very specific connotation to the Jewish people. The number five is not just some, you know, arbitrary number to the Jewish faith. No, number five has a very specific meaning to them. You know what the number five represents? The thing that is the foundation of Judaism, the Pentateuch otherwise known as the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all of which were written by Moses. It's in the five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, that God gave the law through Moses to the people of Israel. And the law is the most important possession that the Hebrew faith has. It is the most important thing that the Jewish people own. So when David chose five stones, they read that story and they understand it as meaning that David took the law as his defense. Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, but I've, Tommy, I've heard preachers preach that. I mean, those five stones have represented all kinds of stuff. They've represented all kinds of things. And maybe they're right. You know, maybe at some level it's true. Maybe it's not. But the Jewish people and those who understand the nature of the law are not that careless in interpretation. They don't interpret things loosely. No. There is a very specific reason for every word in the Word of God. Every word in the Holy Scriptures. In Psalm 119 and verse 105, the writer whom we believe to be David, the psalmist, the shepherd, the king, David declares, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I got news for you. David did not have this. David did not even have the entirety of what we call the Old Testament. What did David have? He had the Pentateuch. He had the first five books of the Bible. He had the Law of Moses. And David was saying, Thy word, thy law is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your law, your word helps me to see where I'm going and helps me to make the right steps. I'm going to tell you, Tommy and I decided, me more than Tommy. <laughs> Usually when I say Tommy and I decided to go up to the mountain, you can pretty much bet it was me who decided and he just take along. <laughs> Couldn't we plan this better? Couldn't you make arrangements six months in advance? Couldn't you get Trump to write a letter telling us to go up the mountain? I, you know, he likes to plan everything and he likes to have everything ironed out. You know, well, me, of course, I'm very, I'm very, uh, exactly. 
you know, I'll jump up and do something at a moment's notice. And, of course, every time I do, Bill, I forget half everything I meant to bring. And, you know, I don't bring everything I should bring. And, you know, so maybe there's something in doing things the way Tommy likes to do it. I don't know. Now, Bill and Johnny are pointing at each other. I gather Bill is more like Tommy and Johnny is more like me. <laughs> but maybe there's something in, you know, planning and putting it all together. But that's not how I operate sometimes. Now, sometimes I do, but a lot of times I can be very spontaneous, you know, and I say, I think we need to go up the mountain this weekend. Well, yesterday, the early part of the day before we went up and started our journey to Oklahoma, I had a few errands I needed to run. You know the old saying, anything that can go wrong will? When we go up there, we try to leave as early as we can so we can get back preferably either before dark or shortly after it turns dark, you know. I'm not crazy these days. You get to be my age. Those of you online, you know, say, what's wrong with driving in the dark? Well, let me tell you, you get to be my age and see if you don't change your mind about driving in the dark. My grandma Belle used to complain about it all the time. I don't like driving in the dark. I don't like driving in the dark. And I'd think, well, good Lord, Grandma, what in the world's wrong with you? Until I got to be her age. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, yeah, I understand. I don't like driving. I nearly killed a dog last night. A dog jumped out into the headlights. Yep. And, I mean, you couldn't see him till he was in the headlights. Yep. And I had to s slow down real fast and kind of swerve, you know, I was and hit my horn. And thankfully, that little dog was smart enough. I don't know what he was doing running out there in the middle of Timbuktu to begin with. Somebody should have had him, you know, pinned up in a yard somewhere. But not a little dog either, good-sized dog, you know. But I honked the horn, and I slammed on the brake, and I tried to swerve to the left to miss him. I'm on a road that only has one lane going and one lane coming. And luckily, he looked over his right shoulder like this, and as he did, he moved that away, see. Mm -hmm. Thank God he didn't look over his left shoulder and move into the road, because I'd have hit him. There'd have been no way I could have avoided him. Well, that put the scare of God in me. <laughs> We're driving further down this road than I swear passed through hell, because you ain't never seen darkness as dark as dark. <laughs> I told Tommy, I said... Last winter, I went up there and spent a few days in a row. I was a couple of days and spent the nights in the cabin and all that. And I said, man, you ain't never seen dark till you've been up there at night. Mm -hmm. I've never, uh, Bill, I've never seen darkness like that. You're wearing a black shirt. That shirt looks like yellow <laughs> compared to what, <laughs> what it looks like up in that mountain. And, and I'm talking, I'm not kidding, by 8 o'clock. See, we, we wound up running so late getting up there that it wound up turning dark on us while we're up there. We hadn't even finished doing everything we needed to do. By the time we were done and we were in the truck and we're getting ready to go home, it was near an 8 o'clock and it was pitch black. I don't mean dark, honey. I mean, there wasn't a star in the sky. There was no moon. It was pitch black. Now, I've been up there before and seen that, but Tommy never had. I said, ha ha, see? I told you it gets dark up here. So we're driving home, and it is pitch black. Every road I travel, I have now traveled dozens and dozens of times. But you know what? In that pitch blackness, I didn't recognize nothing. I might as well have been driving a brand new road I'd never been on in my life because I couldn't see any landmarks. I couldn't see, literally, you can't, I'm not kidding, you cannot see outside of the window of your truck. It is that dark. I told him, I said, I'm going to drive by the lake and see what we see. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we went over the spillway and all you could see was blackness. I mean, there was no reflection from the sun. There was no reflection from stars. There was no reflection from nothing. We were just looking out into a big black abyss. And there were, you couldn't tell where the water was and where the land was. 
I told Tommy, I said, now, I said, I drive this road all the time. And I know that there are big, beautiful meadows and there are fields next to us and there are cows out there pasturing and all that. I said, but you know, when you drive it in this darkness and all the light you have is your headlights. I said, honestly, it feels like we're surrounded by forests. That's the impression you would get. Because your headlight would catch a couple of trees along the side of the road, you know. But that's all you'd see. So the impression you would get is, my Lord, we must be just surrounded by forests. But we weren't. I know when I drive it in daylight, there's big, beautiful fields and they're full of wonderful grass. And the cows are out there dotting the fields, you know, chomping on their cud and they're having a good time. And I love the pastoral views when we drive in and it's so beautiful and it's lit up, you know. But I mean, tell you, we couldn't see nothing. I told Tommy, I said, when I get to the main highway, we're going to catch us a motel. <laughs> I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I said, we're going to catch us a motel. We're going to, I'm going to crawl in that bed and I'm going to sleep. Because I was so exhausted from the whole day, you know. And I mean to tell you, we caught us a Motel 6 once we got to the main highway, and I was literally out like a lamp. I jumped through the shower, I crawled in the bed, and was out literally like that fast. But you know, the interesting thing is, we had headlights, but the headlights only show you so much. Could I stay on the road and be safe? Yes, I could. Could I find my route? Could I see the signs when I came up on them telling me where I needed to turn and what have you? Yes, I could. But it was still pitch black, even though I had lamps on my car. Title of my message today is, Lamps are good. Lamps help, but light is better. You know what, Johnny? For my headlamps and for all the good my headlamps did on that truck, I still prefer driving that in the light. I still prefer driving that when I've got all the light in the world to see everything. Because the headlights only illuminate so much. And when you look at the grand scheme of things, the headlights illuminate precious little. Mm -hmm. I mean precious little. David wrote and said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. He was pretty specific about the value of that lamp. He said, That lamp helps me to see where I'm going. That lamp helps me to maneuver my way through dangers. Sometimes that lamp helps me, helps me to avoid stones or to avoid thorns or thistles. But you know what? That lamp does not illuminate everything. Right. That lamp don't tell me everything. One of the biggest mistakes fundamentalists and evangelical preachers make is when they go to this passage and try to tell you the Bible answers every question, the Bible tells you every answer, everything and anything you need to know, the Bible will tell you, baloney. That's right. I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. Well, that's your opinion. No, it's not. It's the Word of God. You mean the Bible tells me that the Bible doesn't know? Mm -hmm. Read Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where it talks about love. Paul said, for now we see through a glass darkly. Mm -hmm. He said, but then the day's coming when it'll be face to face. Just like we sang today. Oh, what a difference the light makes. Hallelujah. What a difference it makes. We have the Word of God, which is a lamp unto my feet. And it is a light unto my path. But that's all it is. Mm, oh, my Lord. 
Well, preacher, no Pentecostal preacher in the history of the world has ever said those <laughs> words. That's the problem with Pentecost. They should have. We got churches today worship the book rather than the author. Amen. We got churches today spend more time debating and arguing over what's written in the book than celebrating the author. True. Right. I got news for you, honey. The book is a lamp. Oh, listen to me now, because I'm it's gonna get exciting in a minute. The book is a lamp, but the author is daylight. Hallelujah! The author is the light. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. See, that's one of the wonderful things about light versus lamps. See, when you turn on a lamp... That light can travel so far, but then its value begins to diminish. That's why if you're going to be out in the woods hunting, or if you're going to go fishing late in the uh, night, or early in the morning, you know, we, we, hunt, we uh, sportsmen go and we buy these high-powered flashlights, and I mean to tell you, that booger can shine half a mile ahead of you. You can see stuff happen. When I was out at the cabin that one night, I had to go out to the truck to get something. I went out on the porch of the cabin, and I'm not kidding. I could not see anything, no way, nowhere. I said, dear God, there could be a bear standing two feet in front of me, and I would not see that bear. I turned on my flashlight. I had a high-powered flashlight. I pointed it to the truck because that's where I was going. I could see between me and the truck. But I had no idea what was on either side. Because that lamp only did so much good. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It only illuminated where I was pointing it at the moment. I turned that light one direction. I turned that light the other direction. Trying to get a real good sense of what's around me. By the way, I found out from a lady that Oklahoma has black panthers too. <laughs> right. I mean to tell you that don't make you want to stay in the cabin till daylight nothing does we got black bears we got black panther we got uh, bobcats or, or mountain lions we got raccoons we've got wild boar we've got deer if you ever saw the episode of the middle a TV show that cracks me up there was one episode where Sue was out running, practicing to join the track team, and she comes home looking all battered and beaten up. And her mother said, what happened to you? She said, I got hit by a deer. Her mother said, you hit a deer? She said, no, I got hit by a deer. The deer come out of the woods and hit her. <laughs> I can be out in those woods. I can have a high-powered flashlight. I can see a lot as long as I'm pointing at it. But I can't see everything. No matter how good a flashlight you've got, no matter how good a lamp you've got, light is better. Yes. No matter how good a lamp you've got, it is always better to be operating in full daylight. Am I telling the truth? Yes. The Word of God continues. John chapter 1, verse number uh, 5, I'll start at again. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. 
that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, not them, him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, the Jewish nation, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I got news for you, honey. The name that God told Mary to call that child was not Jehovah. The name that God told Mary to call that child was not Muhammad. The name that God told Mary to call that child was Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And that is the name that you must believe in if you're going to be saved to make heaven. That's right. Amen. That's what the Word of God tells us. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, every one of us today that is living for God, every one of us that's walking in relationship with God today, it's not because some preacher wanted you to. It's not because some denomination wanted you to. It's not because mom and daddy wanted you to. It's because God wanted you to. See, God's the one who initiated the work of salvation. No man did it. No human being did it. It says... God did it. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's God's will that you are where you are right now. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, the only man ever born of God our Father, full of grace, and truth. Oh, I'm going to tell you, light beats lamps any day. Oh, when Jesus came, sweetheart, you could see a whole lot more than you could see with the light, the lamp. Yes. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was a lot more to see than merely what the lamp was able to illuminate. A lot of people thought they understood what the law said. Jesus said, you have heard it said thus and so, but I'm here to tell you thus and this. And he corrected their understanding because their understanding of what was written was not accurate. It was not factual. It was not true. And he corrected them in that area. Why? He had the authority to correct them because he was the author of the words to begin with. Hello now. Nobody knows better what's written on the page than the guy that wrote it. That's right. Right, right. Jesus came into the world. All of a sudden, the lights turned on. And the Word of God said, and the darkness comprehended it not. You see, darkness, one thing I love about the concept of light and darkness, darkness cannot contain light. It doesn't have the power to contain it. It can't constrain it. Darkness cannot say, okay, Johnny, you turned on that lamp, but I'm going to swallow up the light so that you still can't see. Oh, no, 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 no. When you turn on a lamp, the darkness cannot comprehend the light. Do you follow what I'm telling you? No, it has to yield to it because it has no ability whatsoever to withstand against the light. Jesus came into the world. Never before had the author of salvation, never before had the king of kings, never before had the creator of the universe and the author of this book walked on planet earth. All of a sudden he was walking on planet earth and honey, it was like the lights come on. All of a sudden it wasn't about trying to read with a little tiny uh, lantern and trying to read with a little candle. All of a sudden the lights were on. We could not only see the book, but now we could see the book living and breathing and walking among us. Everything that was written, we no longer had to read 
and conceptualize in our minds, now we were able to read it as a living epistle. We read the words, God is love. But in Jesus Christ we saw God is love. We read the words, His mercy endureth forever. But in Jesus Christ we saw his mercy endureth forever. Yes. We read the words, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Yet in Jesus Christ we saw the Lord that heals. Do you yes. follow what I'm trying to tell you? Oh, honey, it is so much easier to understand God and to understand what God wants out of us and to understand how we can walk in relationship with Him when we walk in the light. Instead of trying to walk by the lamp. Yes, amen. Oh, hallelujah. Do you understand me now? See, Jesus came so that we could walk in the light. Our message today is supposed to be the light. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, the Word of God said, Ye are the light of the world. The Lord speaking to His disciples a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Why? Because darkness cannot contain light. Even though the light is limited in its ability to radiate and how much it's able to show, you know what? When you're approaching that light from the opposite direction, it ain't, it's going to stand out in the darkness. There ain't nothing the darkness can do to hide it. Yeah. See, we live in a dark world. We live in a sinful world. We live in an evil world. But if we live the way we ought to be living, man, we'd be standing out. We'd be shining like the sun. People around us may be living in darkness, but you know what, Tommy? You know what, Bill? You know what, Johnny? When they turn and they look in our direction, all they're going to see is light. Hallelujah. Because we are the light of the world. A city that is built on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. You don't put a candle, once you light it, you don't put it under a bucket. No, if you do that, you're limiting what the light is able to do. And not only that, you're cutting off the oxygen supply and the candle's going to go out. The Lord said, you don't put a candle under a bushel, but you put it on a candlestick and it giveth light unto you, unto all that are in the house. Last night in the cabin, it was starting to get dark. And I said to Tommy, I said, see that little light switch over there? Flip that light switch. I've got these little lights. You see them in the store. They have a magnetic back. And it's a little light switch. And when you flip the switch, there's these LED lights on either side of it that, that shine. I'm going to tell you, them little lights are bright. I said, turn that. Flip that switch. He flipped it. I turned the switch on a little lamp I had that's... Uh, Battery operated, you know, and I turned on that light. I said, now look, this cabin is lit up like a Christmas tree. That's all you need right there, Bill, just those two lights. And believe me, you had all the light in the world in that cabin. You could see everything as clear as a bell in that cabin. All I had were two little lights. But now if I had put a bucket over any one of them, <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to accomplish very much. The Lord said, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. But then in verse number 16, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, if we're living this thing right, if we're doing this thing right, people are going to see the way we live, listen to me now, and they're going to give God glory. Didn't say they'd glorify you. Didn't say they'd sing your praises. They said they'd give God glory. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I want to tell you, the church, I talked about it last week, the church is so not living up to its potential. There is so much we could be doing that we're not doing. There is so much God wants us to be doing that we're not doing. In Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, the Word of God said, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached the Word of God unto them. Oh, wait, let me, I might be reading this wrong. And preached the Bible unto them. Oh, that, that's what it says. The Bible is what it says. The Bible. Oh, my goodness. I guess I got it wrong altogether. It said, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, listen, and preached Christ unto them. Yes. See, a lamp's help. A light's far better. Instead of preaching a lamp, why don't you preach the light? Hallelujah. Yes. Instead of preaching about a lamp, why don't you preach about the light? Oh, honey, you're going to bring a whole lot more illumination to the room when you preach Jesus than you're going to if you're preaching the Bible. Amen. Your rules, your regulations, your laws, your dogmas, your doctrines. I want to tell you a little secret. Don't stand there and tell me. You go to... Baptist Bible College, you're not going to study the Bible. What? You want to become a Baptist preacher? You go to a Baptist Bible College, you go to a Baptist seminary, you're not going to study the Bible, Johnny. I got news for you. They don't study the Bible. They study Baptist doctrine. They study Baptist teaching. They study the Baptist perspective on everything. You think there's somebody going to get up in a Baptist Bible college and teach those kids something of a Pentecostal nature? Not going to happen. You think somebody going to get up in that Baptist school and teach something of a Quaker notion? No, ain't going to happen. Oh, no, sir. Everything we teach, if you're going to teach at this school, you're going to have to teach thus and so. Everything's all knit up nice and tight. And if that teacher gets out of hand and says one word different than what we believe and what we've established as being the truth, they're out on their ear. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I got news for you, folks. Same thing's true of a Pentecostal Bible college. I'm not picking on the Baptists. Same thing's true of the Pentecostals. Same thing's true of the Methodists. Same thing's true of the Presbyterian. Same thing's true of the Quakers. Same thing's true of any religious denomination or sect. You go to their school and, honey, they're going to teach you their understanding. They're going to teach you their way. They're going to teach you what they have established as being the truth. Am I telling the truth today? we got preachers all over America today getting up preaching out of this book and they're preaching ideas that are so contrary one to the other it's not even funny. Got one preacher one place telling you that God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and you'll be speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance and you got another preacher down the road saying that speaking with other tongues is demonic and devil and it's just the devil and don't you buy into that am I telling the truth? Mm. Oh, but they're both preaching out of the book. Well, the problem is, thy word, O Lord, is the lamp unto my feet. It helps you to walk right. It helps to keep you on the right path. It helps to keep you on the right track. But that's its primary purpose, is to help you walk right. The purpose of Jesus, he's the light. He's not a lamp. He's the light. Honey, when Jesus shows up, the sun rises. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, everything is visible to you. Everything. Now you're able to make choices and decisions based on any number of factors. Because you can clearly see. Am I telling the truth? Right. Oh, lamps are fine. Lamps are good. Lamps help. But light is far better. I'd rather walk in the light any day of the week. That's right. Amen. I would How say. beautiful to That's walk right. in the steps of the Savior.
stepping in the light, stepping in the light. You remember that old hymn we used to sing? Oh, it's an old song. I haven't heard, haven't sung that in a long time. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light. Oh, we need to preach Jesus. When you preach Jesus, the lights come on. I'm going to tell you, I talk to people. I had the opportunity this week. I was driving Uber Friday. And, and I'm almost done, believe it or not, this early. I was driving Friday, and I had a young lady in the car, young uh, African-American girl. And uh, I, she had three stops she needed to make. And the first one, she had to go to her bank. The second one, she had to go to her apartment complex where she lived. And, and we went to the bank. She came back. She got in, and she said something about, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm... This has been such a hard month. This has been a terrible month, you know, and like that. And and then she said, Charles, I need to make a phone call real quick because, you know, I play the videos for her and stuff. So I turned the video music down, and she's on the phone. And when you're in a car alone with somebody and they're on the phone, I got news for you. There ain't no way in the world you're not going to eavesdrop. <laughs> it's not about being nosy. It's not about trying to listen. How in the world are you able to turn off, you know, somebody else in the car talking? You really can't do it. And I'm hearing her, and I realize that she is trying to stave off eviction. She's going through a hard time. And she said, but the lady said she'd wait there till 6. I told her I was going to have to leave work early. She told me initially that uh, I'd be able to make the payment online. And then when I tried to make it online, they wouldn't let me because of my, the status of my account. And, and uh, now I ran to the bank. I got a check, and I'm trying to bring it to you, a certified check. And I'm trying to bring it. But she told me, she, and the man on the other end is telling her, well, I know she may have said that all well and good, but she done left. You know, people are funny. They don't always keep their word, do they? Right. right. And this poor girl was just so upset. She was so bugged out. And when she hung up the phone, she started talking to me a little bit. She said, oh, this has been a tough month. Lord have mercy. I'm trying to... And she began to tell me stuff, you know. And I told her, I said, you know, I pastor a little church here in Dallas. I said, I, I don't listen to secular music. These videos I put on in my car are for the customers. They're not for my benefit. They're for y'all because I don't listen to this junk, to be honest with you. I don't listen to Beyonce. I don't listen to Mariah. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these people. I'm not saying they're singing the devil's music or anything like that. But I love... To worship God and I love to hear praise and worship music in my hearing. So when I'm in the car by myself, I got all kind of wonderful gospel stuff that I'm listening to, you know. And I told her, she said, well, she said, you know, today probably gospel would have served me better than, than this other. I said, you know what, we're going to have us a little talk. And I turned that DVD off and I started talking to her and she, after the after we got her to the uh, apartment complex, and she was, thank God that man stayed long enough for her to bring the check, you know, that she was talking to. And she got that. She came out with her receipt. She got in the car, and she said, I just got to go to the gym and work off some of my frustration. And, you know, she said, I'm telling you, this has been a terrible month. And I, as I'm driving her to her gym, I said, honey, I want to tell you a little secret. It gets better. It does get better. And I begin to talk to her. And, as, and I'm telling you, this is one of those times when you know the Holy Ghost was in every word that come off of my lips. Because I felt led to say certain things to her that I don't say to everybody about my own personal life and my own personal experiences. But I begin to share some things with her from my own personal life. And as I did, she looked at me through the mirror because I'm looking in the mirror at her, you know, and tears are starting to flow down her face. And she says, I experienced that. That's the same thing I went through. That's the same thing that I've experienced. She said, my life just feels like it is one disaster after another. She said, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. She said, my God, my whole life I feel like I've been fighting a battle. I said, oh, honey, you're preaching to the choir. She said, I've told my partner I don't know how many times. I've told the church. 
I don't keep secrets. I don't stand up here and try to act like I'm a bright and shining example of perfection. Jesus is my perfection. I'm not. There's a lot of stuff I probably say about Mr. Trump that I ought to keep to myself, but I just can't do it. I said, sweetie, I grew up in a very abusive home, in a very dysfunctional home. There was a lot of stuff went on there that should never happen. I said, my whole life, I felt like every day of my life was hard. I feel like to this day, I feel like every day of my life is hard. I still wrestle with demons. I still wrestle with psychological and emotional issues that, Bill, I've been wrestling with since I was a kid. I still wrestle with feeling inadequate. It's still hard for me to not feel like a complete and total failure and just want to give up entirely on what I'm doing and, and just quit. Because I'm going to tell you something, that's all I was ever told I was, was a worthless pile of nothing that wasn't ever going to amount to nothing and couldn't do nothing. And then I'm trying to do a work in the LGBT community and I can't even get two dozen people to come together and be part of a church so we can get something done. And when I was in the mainstream, I didn't have that problem, not by a million miles. And you think doing this now, Johnny, since 1993... And it's not one bit easier today than it was in 1993. Not one ounce easier. I told that girl, I said, honey, when you talk about life being hard, when you talk about just being so tired you can't hardly find the motivation to keep moving, I said, let me tell you a little secret. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been living that experience my whole life. So, but let me tell you what Jesus can do. See, don't, don't preach the Word of God to people. Preach the Word of God to people. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld Him, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Don't preach the book. Preach the author. Oh, I'm going to tell you, honey, don't turn on a lamp. Bring up the sun. Hallelujah. That's right. Oh, it makes a difference. And we got to her destination, and I parked my car, and I sat there, I said, now, I said, I've already turned off Uber. I'm not taking any more rides. We'll take as long as you need. And she and I talked for well over an hour. I'm, I told Tommy, I said, it might have been two hours. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't know what time we started. I only know what time we ended. I didn't get home till way later than I normally would get home. By the time we finished our conversation, I reached over, I took hold of her hand, and I began to pray with her. And I prayed with her. And tears are just streaming down her beautiful little face, bless her heart. And after we were done, she said, Thank you so much for letting God use you. And I said, Sweetie, that's all I know to do. <laughs> I said, honestly, Johnny, that's all I know to do. When God wants to use me, He knows I'm available. When God wants to use me, Bill, He knows that I don't care how much money I made Friday, and I only made about half what I normally would make because I, I got off early, you know. It doesn't matter. I said, the minute that I see an opportunity to try to help somebody and encourage somebody and bless somebody and strengthen somebody, you better believe I'm going to jump on that opportunity. Why? Because ye are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Honey, I'm going to tell you something. When you're the light of the world and you're a city built on the, on, on, on the hill, uh, your light's going to shine and you just can't help but shine. Amen. And I told her, I said, I can't help but do. It's like Jesus when he was 12 years old and they found him in the temple. They said, don't you care that you scared Joseph and I out of our minds? We didn't know where you were at. And he looked at them and said, well, don't you understand that I'm going to be about my father's business? I'm the light of the world. i got to do what I need to do. 
Same thing's true for us. We're Christians. We're believers. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He said, I'm passing the torch. I'm giving you now the opportunity to be the illumination. Illuminate! Don't leave people to their Bibles. No, let them see Jesus in you. Let them see the healer in you. Let them see the merciful in you. Let them see the loving in you. Let them see the graceful in you. Am I telling the truth today? Let them see the one who delivers in you. You know what they won't see in you? If you're, if you're reflecting Jesus, they won't see judgment. They won't see criticism. They won't see condemnation. They're not going to see a threat to go to hell. I didn't see Jesus running around threatening people with hell. Did you? No. I didn't hear him preach one message about hell. Now, do I believe hell's real and, you know, hell's hot and heaven's real? Yes, I do. But I don't have to get up and preach on it every Sunday. No, I got a whole lot better message than that. Let me preach the light. Jesus said, and I'm closing right now. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you preach the light and people be drawn to him like flies. How do I know? Let me finish what I started reading to you about Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Not the law, not the word of God, not the Bible, Christ. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Listen, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. See, Philip wasn't just preaching a message. The power of God was working with him. Verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Woo! I told you the church isn't living up to what we ought to be living up to. We're not shining as brightly as we ought to be shining. Because you know what the reaction of that city was? You know what the reaction in Samaria was? Verse number 8. <clears throat> and there was great joy in that city. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you preach Jesus and let the light shine, <laughs> honey, you're going to bring some happiness to your town. You're going to bring some happiness to your family. We got people out there that have families that are broken. We got people out there who are so stuck on the book that they forgot who, who the author is. That's right. And they're not living like the light. They're living like darkness. Kicking their kids out of the home. All of a sudden you get all this duress and all this stress going on. Uh, got news for you, honey. If you'd preach Jesus, if you'd live Jesus, if you'd preach the light and be the light, there'd be great joy in your city. Because the Word of God said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. See you doing things that only God can do. See you doing things that only the power of God can accomplish. And what will happen? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Oh, I'm going to tell you today, lamps help, but light is better. Would you stand with me this afternoon?